Last month, we talked about Nuremberg and the tragedy of the Holocaust in Europe. Today, we are dealing with the other Nuremberg, the Tokyo War Trials. Well, let's first give you some context of the Japanese war crimes. And let's put this into the context of the origins of the Second World War in the Pacific. Well, in 1852, Admiral Perry brought a U.S. fleet into Tokyo Bay to force the Japanese to begin trading with the United States. This helped to usher in the Meiji period, where the Emperor of Japan attempted to modernize Japan. And they did, in many ways, westernize it. The British helped them to build a modern navy. The Germans helped them to build a modern army. But still, the culture of Japan remained, in many ways, still functioning on medievalism. In 1904, the Japanese attacked the Russian fleet at Port Arthur because they were afraid they might lose Korea because the Japanese wanted Korea as one of their colonies, which they got and treated brutally. They annexed Korea in 1910. The invasion of Manchuria by the Japanese occurred in 1931. The Papa State of Manchukuo was established at that time. How many of you saw the movie The Last Emperor? If you haven't, I suggest you see it. They took the young boy who was the child emperor before the revolution in China and made him the puppet emperor of Manchukuo. The imperial army assured Hirohito when they finally attacked China that the invasion would be over in a few months. Most of the Japanese army was involved in fighting in mainland China until the very end of the war in 1945. There was tremendous rivalry between the civilian government and the military government in Japan. The system that the Japanese evolved was that based on a constitutional monarchy like Britain with basically a figurehead, an emperor, who the Japanese deified as a god, at least some of them did, and a legislature, and then, of course, the military and, and government. Well, during the 1920s and 1930s, the Japanese military succeeded through assassination and coups to weaken that democracy so that in the late 30s and early 40s, the military were clearly running Japan. In 1940, Japan conquered France. I'm sorry, the Germans conquered France. And six weeks later, as you see here on this map, and we'll point out, and get this to work. It's not working. Okay, French Indochina, that map, Vietnam, that the Japanese occupied. Vietnam. And that, of course, what you see on that map basically is the Japanese Empire and the area that we're going to talk about today and the treatment of the people that live there. On September 27, 1940, they signed a tripart agreement with Germany and Italy. Interestingly enough, though, remember the Japanese, uh, they would only come to defend Japan if Japan was attacked by someone else. When the Japanese occupied Indochina, the United States, public opinion finally turned against them because of Japanese aggression in China as well. President Roosevelt embargoed the oil and tin exports and, order, and said they had to withdraw from China and, and Indochina. In July of 41, Japan had only six month oil supply left for their imperial fleet. So then they began to attack they planning the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 2nd, 7th, 1941. The map you see here shows you the results of the five army attack plan of Malaya and Singapore, South China and Hong Kong, the Philippines, Thailand and Burma, and Dutch East Indies. 
It is my opinion that if the Japanese had had the manpower and shipping, they could have conquered Hawaii and occupied Hawaii as well. They didn't because they had deployed all those forces as you see. It would have lengthened the war considerably. I still think we would have won the Second World War. The man who orchestrated that plan was Prime Minister General Tojo. He created what he called the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. With firmness we fight, with kindness we build, fight onward till Asia is Asian's own. In other words, throw out the Dutch, the French, the British imperialists. But all they did was replace them with Japanese imperialists. Japan surrendered, middle of August, September 2nd, 1945. The empire had finally faced total defeat. The Japanese had never lost a war in their history. 260 Allied ships filled Tokyo Bay. The Allied military gathered for the final surrender, as you can see. And here is the Japanese delegation. The ceremony was officiated by Douglas MacArthur. The top-headed man in that ceremony in the front with the cane is rather ironic because he had been the assistant Japanese Prime Minister in the 30s and uh, he had an attempted assassination had blown off his leg so he had a hard time climbing up the rope ladder but he didn't want the war he was opposed to the war so he was the only former government official they could get to come to the surrender he would he was willing to sign it when all the representatives had finished, MacArthur announced, quote, let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. Standing in awe at that time was a Japanese officer. And overhead flew hundreds and hundreds of U.S. carrier planes. And he said, how could we ever believe that we could have defeated this immense power? Well, MacArthur was appointed now the, to head the occupation of Japan. And on September 11th, after he had landed, he ordered the arrest of 39 principal subjects of the Japanese government for war crimes. And they would have a war crimes trial modeled on the Nuremberg trial, which was still underway. So on January 19th, MacArthur issued this proclamation ordering the International Military Tribunal of the Far East. The same day he approved the charter of the International Military Tribunal and prescribed how it would be formed, what crimes would be considered, how the, tri the tribunal would function, and the judges. Here is the Tokyo trial courtroom where they were held. It was the former war ministry offices in Tokyo, one of the few bombings that had not been totally annihilated during all the firebombing of Tokyo. After the war, Japan was pulverized. 60% of Tokyo flattened. Almost every major city in Japan had been firebombed. Millions were homeless. The economy was at a standstill. People were starving to death. So the International Tribunal met in this building, which actually had been the Imperial Japanese headquarters that directed the war across the Pacific. The Tokyo trial courtroom began, the trial itself began on May 3rd, 1946. The prosecution opens its case, charging defendants with crimes against peace, against uh, conventional war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The trial continued for two and a half years. The person here in the audience mentioned that they had a friend who appeared as a witness at that trial. Unfortunately, they have passed away. Otherwise, it would be interesting to have them comment. The testimony was heard from 419 witnesses. Over 4,000 exhibits of evidence were presented against the accused and affidavits from 779 further individuals. These indictments accused them of promoting conquest, 
contemplated and carried out murder, mayhem, ill-treating prisoners of war, civilian internees, forcing uh, labor and, and inhumane conditions, plundering public and private property, wantling, wantling, destroying cities, towns, and villages beyond any justification of military necessity. And at the same time, their army perpetrated mass murder, rape, pillage, and brigandage, torture, and barbaric cruelties upon helpless civilians of the overrun countries. Here are the judicial panel of judges, the international panel that represented the powers whose countries or colonies had been overrun. There were 11 nations and an Australian high court judge as uh, the president. They were all appointed by MacArthur. Here now are some of the Class A criminals that were indicted. There were three levels of trials that were conducted. The Class A criminals were uh, indicted primarily for the conspiracy to wage and start and perpetrate a brutal war. 28 high-ranking Japanese politicians, including the Prime Minister Tojo, were tried in Tokyo at the first trial. The class B, which were violations of laws and customs of war, and Class C, crimes against humanity, those trials were held by national governments across the Pacific, 50 different trials. We'll talk about that before we end today. Here is a list of the broad range of Japanese officials who were tried in Tokyo. As you see, they represent the government, the armed forces, and also people involved in industry. By the way, this program is being videoed, so you'll be able to see the whole thing again on the website of this Air Museum. So don't think you have to take notes quickly here or try to memorize all this. Now let's take a look at each of the defendants. By far the best one was Tojo. He was the chief mastermind of the war in the Pacific. Second, General Dahara. He was instrumental in the Japanese invasion of Manchuria that began the war in China and the mastermind of the Manchurian drug trade. They helped basically to finance the war by manufacturing drugs and selling them throughout the Far East. Hitota, military radical, support of the radical military government that extended the war and suppressed freedom throughout Japan. Kumura planned war in China and Southeast Asia, lax in preventing the atrocities that occurred and the building of the Burma Railroad. Muto plotted the war in China, led troops in the Nanking Massacre. Atagi organized Japan's atomic bomb program the Army Chief of Staff who planned the Pacific War. Masui commanded the troops that committed the Nanking massacres. So here again, to emphasize for you, are the three categories of war crimes that made up the indictment against the Japanese. Very similar, again, established in international law at Nuremberg. So what were the specific criminal acts that brought about this important trial? Well, here is a brief overview of these war crimes. There is a list, and we'll talk about a few of these right now. Wait, we'll go back. In Shanghai, the Japanese commanders ordered victorious Japanese troops on a 150-mile quick-time march to overtake and conquer the nationalist capital of Nanking. As an incentive, the soldiers would be permitted to rape, loot, and kill without restraint. When the Japanese arrived, they embarked on a six-week orgy of mass killings 
200 to 300,000 men, women, and children were destroyed. Most were civilians. Japanese officers posed for cameras as they competed in a contest to see how fast they could kill 100 people with their swords. When they lost count, they held a rematch to see who would be first beheading 150 prisoners. Other Japanese soldiers formed killing teams, some assigned to toss the heads and corpses into piles as if they were firewood. Tens of thousands of Chinese women were raped, mistreated, and slaughtered. Documents show that the Japanese army asked the government to provide sex slaves for every 70 soldiers in the Japanese army. There were six million soldiers in the Japanese army. We estimate that anywhere from 70 to 86,000 women were forced into sex slavery. 23 documents were gathered by the Japanese cabinet secretariat between uh, 2017 and 2019. They included 13 classified dispatches from Japanese consulates in China and to Tokyo, uh, backdating to 1938. The number of these poor women is not certain, but historians say they numbered in the tens of thousands or more, and their purpose was to prevent the spread of disease and curtail rape among the soldiers. This they failed to do. The Japanese Navy also engaged in crimes, as you can see from this list, of killing both POWs, who, who were uh, captured by them, obviously, and bombing ships, hospitals, and uh, killing people off of merchant ships rather than helping them. The Japanese bayoneted tens of thousands of Chinese civilians. They shot thousands of people brutally. And even worse than the Germans, they practiced beheading throughout Asia. Then let us turn our attention to germ warfare. During the war, the Japanese medical doctors invented and perpetrated enough bacteriological germs to kill every human being on Earth. If you were here when I talked about the invasion, uh, the purported invasion that we would have of Japan at the end of the war, they were prepared to unleash these botulisms and other forms of plague upon our armed forces. A medical doctor, Ishii Shiro, was the organizer and promoter of bacteriological and chemical warfare. In 1936, the Japanese army gave him permission to build a vast facility in Manchuria, where he could experiment to his heart's content. There were experiments with bubonic plague, cholera, other diseases. Thousands of prisoners were used for anything that took the doctor's fancy. Human guinea pigs, mostly Chinese, but Russians and a few American POWs, were known as logs or monkeys. Some were exposed to freezing temperatures. Some were hung upside down to see how long it would take before they choked to death. Some were cut open without anesthesia and their organs removed. Some were injected with legal germs. And another specialty unit was used to infect large numbers of rats with deadly bacteria and then they were dropped by airplane over Japanese cities to hopefully destroy the population. And then there is slave labor. A few years ago, I gave a program on this to a, a, in a retirement home with many, many retirees from the armed forces. One was a U.S. Marine. He had been in Beijing on December 7, 1941, at Pearl Harbor, after the day of Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese marched into Beijing and he was captured. He served as a prisoner of war in three separate Japanese prison camps, including finally being transported to Japan to work in a coal mine. There he was used 
in a ruinous way until he was reduced to skin and bones. He witnessed the firebombing of Tokyo, but he was far enough removed where he could see it, but he was not hurt by it. Look at this record of prisoners of war. Let's compare the German and Italian prisoners of war, how many died when they took in our uh, allied soldiers compared to the Japanese. So now here are the Japanese leaders during the trial. And let us talk principally about the most famous one, Tojo. He had been prime minister during much of the Second World War. Complicated figure, revered by conservatives as a patriot, by loathed by many in the West for prolonging the war, which ended only with the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. He ordered the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. He ordered five additional attacks by armies across Asia between 1941 and 42. He orchestrated the war in China between 1937 and 1944. He authorized prisoner slave labor. About a month after August 15, 1945, when the emperor had announced surrender, Togo shot himself, but he botched it. He failed his suicide, and he was arrested in his home. Tojo was executed as the chief figure behind Japan's planning and execution of the World War II in the Pacific. Besides Tojo, six others were executed. And you can see here are the other uh, sentences that were given out. Documents discovered in 2021 that after the executions, the Americans took extreme steps to keep the ashes of Tojo and the others from falling into the hands of extreme militarists in Japan and turning them into some sort of shrine. The document states that cremation was completed, the ovens were clean of even the minutest amount of ash. Special precautions were taken to preclude overlooking those particles, and then they were flown out over the Pacific, 30 miles out into the Pacific Ocean, east of Yokohama, and disposed. This discovery brings partial closure to a painful chapter of Japanese history but still plays out today as conservative Japanese politicians attempt to whitewash history, leading to friction with wartime victims, especially in China and South Korea. Now, besides Tokyo, there were other trials of Japanese war criminals across Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Singapore surrendered in 1942. It was the largest surrender of British and Commonwealth troops in history. These soldiers then became slave labor and were forced to build the Burma Railroad. Here is a map of that death railway. Of course, some of you, many of you have seen the bridge over the River Kwai. Doesn't quite show you the real brutality, but you get the idea. The railroad was built and completed under the most brutal slave labor conditions imaginable. 180,000 were forced to work alongside of 60,000 Allied POWs. And you can see how well treated they were. Maltreated, starved, beaten, and hanged. The Singapore trial, some of the worst Japanese officers for this brutal event were put on trial. Here they are. Here are the results. In Darwin, Australia, a trial was held by the Australian military. They too tried Japanese for crimes committed against Australian POWs across the Southwest Pacific. Pictured here is the Australian judges. And here are, oops, sorry, I got that wrong, didn't I? There's the court there, the judges. There, and now here are some of the defendants.
Japanese prisoners sentenced to death for the ill treatment of the POWs. The Australian Tribunal, as you see, indicted, convicted, and sentenced to death many of these prisoners. In the Philippines, this trial of Japanese involved charges regarding the treatment of POWs and the mistreatment by the Japanese of tens of thousands of, civili of, ja of Filipino civilians during the occupation. As you may or may not know, the island of Mindanao was an open rebellion through most of the occupation with the Japanese. The Japanese, it, the, it, it was the only country in their empire where the United States was able to arm, train, and equip large guerrilla forces that actually helped in the liberation of the Philippines. Unfortunately, that liberation continued until the end of World War II, Japanese soldiers held out. In fact, there was one Japanese soldier who held out to the 1970s, came back to Japan, and couldn't stand it, and went back and lived in the jungle again. Not me, this is true. 78,000 US, Filipino, and American troops surrendered in May of 1942. This is a map of the march they were forced to make from Bataan to the prison camp. It became known as the Bataan Death March, April, May, 42. Many US POWs died on the march. Out of 76,000 Filipino and US soldiers, 10,000 died. It was a 75-mile march. Here is the occupation uh, death toll. At the very end of the war, after we had invaded, MacArthur invaded, if you remember, some of you were here when I talked about the Battle of Leyte Gulf and the invasion of the Philippines. The uh, Japanese held out unnecessarily in Manila and caused the battle deaths of 100,000 Filipinos. General Yamashita, the Tiger of Manila, they called him. He was tried for these crimes. Now it's very interesting because he didn't order the Bataan Death March. In fact, he had left the Philippines and was leading the troops conquering Singapore. And he also, uh, even though he came back, well, let's put it to you this way, he was against the war and the powers to be after these two victories shipped him to Manchuria for the remainder of the war. He was only brought back to the Philippines after MacArthur invaded. It was a Japanese admiral that ordered the defense of Manila. He had nothing to do with, he wanted the troops to retreat out of Manila. And of course, 100,000 so, uh, Filipinos died and many Americans died. But he was hanged on February 23rd, 1946. I'm sorry, we'll go back. He was hanged for those crimes. I think there were others that really committed it, but he was made the scapegoat. So let's take a look at a summary of all of these trials. There were 2,200 trials at many locations. And many Japanese tried, many convicted, about 1,000 received death sentences. Well, what about Hirohito? Why wasn't he put on trial? At that time, most Americans thought he was a war criminal. This picture you see is the first time the Emperor of Japan had ever been photographed with a commoner, ever. He went to see MacArthur a few months after the beginning of the occupation. MacArthur recorded this in his book, Reminiscences. Hirohito said to him at that meeting, quote, I come to you, General MacArthur, to offer myself to the judgment of powers you represent, 
as the one to bear sole responsibility for every political and military decision and action taken by my people in the conduct of the war." Unquote. MacArthur said that this made a tremendous impression upon him. This courageous assumption of the responsibility implicit with death, a responsibility clearly belied by fact of which I was fully aware, moved me to the very marrow of my bones. He was an emperor by inherited birth, but in that instance, I knew I faced the first gentleman of Japan in his own right. MacArthur went on later to record that he believed if the emperor were indicted and hanged as a war criminal, military government would have been instituted throughout Japan and guerrilla warfare would probably have broken out. The emperor's name had been stricken from the list of war crimes. But of all this, Hirohito himself knew nothing. The emperor called on MacArthur often during the occupation. Their conversations ranged over a wide variety of problems in Japan and the world. MacArthur always explained carefully the underlying reasons for occupation policy and found, it, found that Hirohito had a more thorough grasp of many democratic concepts than almost any other Japanese. He played a major role in the spiritual regeneration of Japan after World War II. And his loyal cooperation with the Allied government and influence had much to do with the success of the American occupation. So I have looked further into this issue because there were many Americans after World War II who hated the Japanese. Many who wouldn't buy Toyotas or Hondas or any Japanese products. MacArthur had encouraged Hirohito to write a memoir explaining the roots of why Japan had gone to war. The diary of his imperial chamberlain was handwritten in pencil and black ink. It covers the years 1928 to 1945. In it, Hirohito relates the events leading up to Pearl Harbor, the war, and Japan's surrender. Before becoming emperor, Hirohito had traveled across Europe, and this gave him an Anglo-American bias for the way in which he wished to rule Japan. First, he saw it as a British-style government of a parliamentary monarchy. In it, his role should be limited as a figurehead as were both most British monarchs, particularly today. Second, his greatest fear was preventing the political instability between the, the civilians who wanted peace and the military who wanted to build an empire across Asia. And the friction between these two expansionists and the international cooperation with the West that he favored Hirohito saw his greatest responsibility was containing this rivalry that could perhaps lead to civil war. Hirohito believed that if he had vetoed the decision to attack Pearl Harbor, the country would have erupted in a civil war and Japan would have been destroyed. In other words, the emperor chose to basically translate international relations into domestic accommodations. In this process, he failed to achieve either. Japan still went to war, lost the war, and all this brutality occurred and Japan was almost destroyed. This makes Hirohito neither a villain nor a saint. He was not a pacifist, girded by a firm moral compass. But neither was he the narcissistic, warmongering opportunist that many people made him out to be. Historians have long debated the emperor's culpability in directing the war. General MacArthur's role in helping shape a successful post-war Japan believed that absolving Hirohito of a direct responsibility was the best means to that end. Though the Second World War has ended, some still revere convicted war criminals at this war shrine where 2.4 million people are buried, former servicemen of the war. 
However, Japan's aggressive militarism overall has long faded. In 1941, after the Japanese took Singapore, they found a print of Gone with the Wind. And they showed the film to the general Japanese staff officers who had taken Singapore. A murmur arose in that audience. What have we done? We have declared war on these people. They can make a movie that is so far above anything that we have in Japan. The expense, the special effects, the orchestration of thousands of people. There was silence in the projector room after the first act with all these Japanese officers when it was dawning on them that what they were up against. They were saying that if they had only released Gone with the Wind in 1940 Japan, World War II could have been avoided. I don't necessarily agree with that. But this, this I thought, is an interesting story, nonetheless. 81 years ago, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. It was a grave error, bringing the world's mightiest country into the war and dooming the Japanese empire into oblivion. A clear-sighted Japanese admiral supposedly lamented, quote, I fear all we have done is awake a sleeping giant and filled him with a terrible resolve. Today, Japan is a peaceful, rich, and innovative leader. It was the Japanese who rebuilt their country, but their task was made easier by the superpowers that had defeated them. Not only was the American midwife to a liberal, capitalist, democratic government in Japan, it also created a world order in which Japan was free to trade and grow. This order is not perfect and did not apply everywhere, but it was better than anything that had come before. Unlike previous great powers, the United States did not use its military dominance to win commercial advantage at the expense of Japan, or may I say Germany. On the contrary, it allowed itself to be bound most of the time by common rules, and that rule-based system allowed much of the world to avoid war and grow and prosper. In alliance with the US, the Japanese trade and international role is strong. They con the continued rise of a military China has now reinforced this alliance and Japan's commitment to democracy and a stronger joint commitment to the defense of Asia. I thought today would be appropriate for me to comment on what is now occurring in time, the new war, the invasion of the Ukraine. An international court of justice says that, tri that Putin should be tried as a war criminal for planning aggressive war and for the committing of crimes of, against humanity of innocent civilians. The World Court has ordered Russia to suspend military action in the Ukraine. In 1938, France and Germany stood by while Austria and Czechoslovakia were gobbled up by Hitler, signing a meaningless agreement at Munich on Czechoslovakia because of the threat of Adolf Hitler going to war and the fear of war after losing a million men in France and in Britain in World War I. This merely perpetrated a greater inferno. The United States today and its allies are being pushed harder and harder and harder, not only to give assistance in materials and train embargoes, but also to stop this tin-plated Mussolini and his empty threats. The people in Lithuania are deathly afraid that they will be next. Finland now wants to become part of NATO because they are afraid. Do we wish to have a replay of the 20th century? I say we don't. And I say it is our responsibility to stand up to this naked aggression. 